I'm Behrouz Gamari Tabrizi. I'm the director of Sharmin and uh, Bijan Musawar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. And uh, um, <coughs> this year, I'm going to make this very, very short because we are in sort of time is limited today. Uh, this year, uh, we are starting our uh, uh, lecture series with uh, uh, Leon uh, uh, Stanford uh, talk. And uh, usually they say that we save the best for last, but this year we uh, brought the, <laughs> the best first. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, there's a uh, very exciting lineup of, uh, of uh, lectures, meetings, programs, concerts, films. And uh, so please do uh, check our website. I think there's a flyer outside uh, there. Uh, uh, please pick up that flyer and you have an idea about the kind of programs that we have uh, for, uh, lined up for you this year. <coughs> um, we only have less than an hour today. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sorry about that, Leo. Um, but let me just uh, introduce uh, our speaker. Uh, Leo Sternfeld um, is um, assistant professor of uh, history at Penn State University. Uh, he uh, was educated uh, first uh, in uh, Ben Gurion uh, in Negev in Israel, um, and then uh, got his PhD uh, from the University of uh, Texas in uh, Austin. Um, as uh, the famous saying goes, we have Austin and then we have Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. His uh, first book, uh, uh, which came out uh, Stanford University Press uh, last year, Between Iran and Zion, Jewish Histories of 20th Century Iran, is a highly, highly recommended book. And uh, please uh, uh, order it directly, either from Stanford University Press or Amazon. I don't want to advocate for Amazon, but uh, these days that's the only bookstore we have. And uh, it's a fascinating study, and, and today Lior would uh, talk about this issue of looking at the Iranian Jewish uh, community as both people who uh, played a pivotal role in state building Iran, as well as people who basically uh, gave, uh, gave voice to oppositional politics in Iran. So uh, without further ado, I introduce uh, Professor Sternfeld. Thank you. Thank you so much for this lovely introduction, Beruz. And uh, I want to thank Beruz and the uh, <coughs> Sharmin and Bijan Musavar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies for organizing this talk. And uh, I had great time uh, seeing uh, old friends here, and uh, I thank you for that. Uh, before I start my talk, and um, uh, and we have the book cover here, I just want to say that uh, I don't mind you to judge this book by the cover. So <laughs> just, I really love it, and and it's okay with me if you just see the cover and say it's a great book. Um, so you know, just to warm up a little bit. Uh, I usually start with um, with a question. I tell people that I work on Iran, uh, on Iranian Jews, and usually, I mean, many people don't know that Jews live in Iran. So by show of hands, um, how many Jews live in Iran today? If you think that the answer is A, 80 to 100,000, raise your hand. B, less than 2,000. We have a couple of hands. Uh, C, 20 to 35. D, more than 100,000. All right, so tough competition. The answer is C. Um, and the numbers are, <laughs> uh, the numbers are, are, are very varied. Uh, and we get different sources with different numbers. And the range is actually even uh, bigger than that. But, it's acceptable to think that today uh, the numbers are around 20, 25,000. Um, all right, so now that we're warmed up. <laughs> uh, in summer 2016, I traveled to Paris to conduct the last interviews for this book. 
I interviewed the first president of the Islamic Republic, Abu Hazan Bani Sadr, and the renowned Iranian uh, intellectual, Dayush Ashuri. Uh, when we started talking, Ashuri asked me what my book is about. And I told him that I'm hoping to write the history of Iranian Jews in the 20th century. Ashuri, a shrewd humorist, uh, sarcastically asked me, what about the other 2,600 years? Uh, with this question, Ashuri was poking fun at the Iranian Jewish custom to start each one's personal or family history with the Babylonian exile that brought them to Iran some 2,700 years ago. In a way, it reflects the state of the field of Iranian Jewish history. The tendency of writing this long history as a one linear narrative goes far beyond the informal family or community histories. The field of Iranian Jewish history lacks depth and breadth that do justice to the rich history of these communities. This was true before the revolution of 1979 and even truer today. A few years ago in grad school, when I compiled my reading list for the comprehensive exam, there was one monograph, one book on Jewish history in the 20th century. The book was Habib Levy's The Comprehensive History of the Jews of Iran that was written in 1961 and covered the history of Iranian Jews since the Babylonian exile some 2,700 years ago. There is a lot to say about this corpus of Habib Levy, his own history, training, life, and I'm happy to get to it later in the Q&A. But now, shall we ask, can one book of three volumes in the Persian original edition discuss 2,700 years in a nuanced and sophisticated way? After the 1979 uh, revolution, with the relocation of the majority of Iranian Jews to the US, we see that the way Iranian Jews talked about their history and wrote their history has changed drastically. Iranian Jews now had to position themselves not just in relation to the US majority society, but also vis-a-vis -vis the dominant, mostly Ashkenazi, American Jewish community. We see how the language to describe their experience, uh, to their experience in their previous homeland has changed. They borrowed terms from the vocabulary that Ashkenazi American Jews used to describe their histories back in Europe. Events of unrest became pogroms, a term that was never used by Iranian Jews back in the day. The Mahale, the Jewish neighborhood, turned into a ghetto. Both examples are used when speaking English and not when speaking about it in Persian. Now, I want to show you uh, Habib Levy's book. Uh, so this is the original 1961 edition. This image appeared in the book. And it shows Habib Levy at the entrance to the uh, Tehran uh, Mahale, to the Jewish neighborhood in Tehran. Um, and this is the same photo in the English edition of 1999. Uh, and it says an entrance to the Tehran ghetto. Now, the usage of ghetto, uh, uh, all right, uh, this is, I'll, I'll get to it in a second. The usage of ghetto is not just borrowing a neutral term from a different language. Using ghetto in a Jewish context after 1945 creates a world of images they do not necessarily reflect correctly or contextualize Jewish existence in Iran. Just to take from a close enough example to show the difference, Harat el-Yahud in Cairo remained Harat el-Yahud in the Jewish writing and writing on Jews in Cairo. Otherwise, it's translated as a Jewish quarter. And this goes for other Jewish neighborhoods across the Middle East. Now, to show you that it's not just purely academic issue, this is from a news outlet in Israel from uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and the title is, Who Stole the Scrolls from Tehran's Jewish Ghetto? Later it appeared that no one stole it. Uh, but, <laughs> but the question is there. Um, it tells us something much broader about our ability to think about the Jewish history in non-Western societies in general, but also in Iran specifically. The narrative as it goes is that Iranian Jews saw themselves as Iranian. They stayed out of politics. They celebrated their Persian heritage, Suleiman Chaim, for example. Uh, they suffered from hatred and discriminations that stopped for a while under the Pahlavi monarchy. 
the community was very Zionist and the alliance between Israel and Iran uh, also supports that notion. And that history ended with the 1979 revolution, by the way, with a Zionist redemption. Such narratives prevents us from seeing the immense diversity of the Iranian Jewish community and the many voices that existed in that community throughout the years. The pushback usually comes when talking about political activism, when talking about their involvement in the Communist Party in a way that we don't usually see in cases like Iraq or Egypt. It prevents us from, from investigating the nature of Middle Eastern and Iranian communism, or even to analyze what the term Iranian Zionism meant. We already know that Jews were prominent part of communist parties in other Middle Eastern countries like Iraq, Egypt, Morocco, and others. We know that until 1948, Jews were pretty assimilated in their respective Middle Eastern societies, and no one would make such assertions regarding Jews in any other Middle Eastern countries. So why do we see it here? There is a very good visual explanation of that historiographical mold. Mayor Gall's work shows us how little we care to know about the Middle East. So this is Mayor Gall, is a visual artist, and um, this work is called uh, Nine Out of 400, The West and the Rest. And in this work, he shows the history, high school history textbook, 400 pages. Nine pages are dedicated to the Middle East. Not Middle East Jews, not Middle Eastern Jewish societies, histories, the Middle East, all of it, nine pages out of 400. Now, this is part of a much bigger problem in the Israel society, 50% of which is of Middle Eastern background. So if I want to connect this to the state of uh, research on Iranian Jews, on Middle Eastern Jews, on Iranian history in general, I want to see in real numbers how come we have such a shallow understanding of the Jewish Iranian experience. And that's what I found. I went to Waldcat. Even though it's a cat, it's the, be the man's best friend. <laughs> um, the source that gives us data from libraries worldwide. And I searched Jews, Iran, history, 20th century. I got 31 results. Um, 31 results, uh, one history book, uh, Habib Levy, a uh, few collections of essays, uh, we have some uh, PhD and master thesis, uh, Judeo-Persian literature, some family albums, um, VHS home videos, um, but again, not research, not body of research that we can even talk about. Um, most of it in Hebrew. All right, and then I searched Jews, Iran, history, 19th century. We got 10 results. Uh, actually, two of them are pretty good books, but only 10. Now, the broadest term for Jews Iran history gives us 390 results. Now, just to compare, I replaced Iran with other countries. The first one, Egypt. We get, on the 20th century, 105 results. Not a whole lot, but still three times more than the Iran. Uh, Iraq we have 122 results. United States, 1,503. China, 154. And to be honest, I didn't know that there were Jews in China until I searched it. <laughs> um, and you know, going on the obvious, Germany, we have 2,794. So it's a real problem here. Uh, now, I want to provide a quick overview um, of history of Zionism in Iran. Zionism first came to the fore in Europe as a national movement of the European Jews. Uh, in a way, it was reaction to the European enlightenment uh, and nationalism. We see the conversation in the Jewish communities regarding Zionism in the, 90, in the 1890s onwards, and we see a movement that offered Jews decent, decent existence in place that wouldn't reject them as Europe did, or even truer would be to say Eastern Europe. There were many paradoxes in the Zionist thought that because of our short time I cannot cover, but one of the biggest among them was that the great promise of Zionism was to allow Jews becoming fully European when they migrate out of Europe. 
and we can talk about other um, we can talk about other paradoxes. Herzl uh, internalizing anti-Semitic anti-Semitic stereotypes, and my favorite of all is uh, we don't believe in God, but he promised us this land. Um, at this point, no leader of the nascent Zionist movement even considered the Oriental Jews as part of the future Israeli or Zionist societies. The Oriental Jews themselves, having had very different experience in the 19th and early 20th centuries, did not articulate a clear response to the political development in Europe. Moreover, the Jews of the Middle East had not undergone the process of secularization that was essential to the Zionist paradigm and maintained the religious perception of Eretz Israel, Ottoman, mandatory Palestine as the Holy Land. Jews from the Middle East and Iran immigrated in small numbers to Palestine throughout the ages. But we have to remember that the region was part of the Ottoman Empire, so travels were indeed pretty common especially for pilgrimage and the economy that facilitated it. The message of political Zionism first struck a chord with Jewish Iranians in 1917, following the Balfour Declaration. That came at the, at the same time of the first disillusion Iranian Jews experienced with the outcomes of the Constitutional Revolution. All of a sudden, the promise of relocating uh, to place of their own sounded rather tempting. Iranian Jews established Zionist associations to teach Hebrew and handle the preparation for a mass exodus. However, shortly after, in 1925, with the ascendance of Reza Pahlavi as the new Shah, who overthrew the Qajar dynasty, the new national project and the vision of a new Iranian society, with almost a diminished role of religion and an emphasis on ethnic identity, made the Jews shelf their plans for relocation. Reza Shah removed all the laws that barred Jews and other minorities from living in certain areas, uh, engaging some occupations, and joined the army, for example. Jews have now become nominally part of the Iranian society. Zionism remained a more clandestine, underground operation. Zionist organizations could operate openly in some fields and then uh, band all together. Sympathies to Zionism and different interpretations of Zionism started to split the communities in the 1930s. Shmuel Chaim, uh, the Jewish representative to the Majlis, had a harsh disagreement with another Jewish dignitary, Lokman Nahorai. While Nahorai espoused the interpretation and perhaps the practice that Jews should join full force the Zionist or international organizations, Chaim believed that Zionism is overall a positive development, but Iranian Jews should, not, should fight for their rights and status in Iran and not to forfeit it for any messianic dream. Chaim published newspaper called The Chaim Life, in which he preached for integration efforts for the Jews, uh, participation in political life, developing national consciousness. Chaim was actually executed by Reza Shah for mostly false accusation of being complicit in an attempt to assassinate him. In any case, following this incident, any non-Iranian organized movement was banned from operating in Iran, Zionism included. World War II changed things around once again. In 1941, uh, the Allied armies invaded and occupied Iran and forced Reza Shah to abrogate in favor of his son, Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, who opened, his politi opened the political sphere to any and every political movement, Zionism included. For the first time, Zionist organizations based in mandatory Palestine opened headquarters in Tehran and other Iranian cities to care for the needs of Polish Jewish refugees that arrived in Iran, but that's part of another story. In any case, after seeing the Polish refugees who fled Europe, first the Nazis and then Stalin Soviet Union, Iranian Jews went through a couple of, of stages. One, the leadership recognized the need to help the brethren over in Europe, escape the Nazis first, and then to help them establish national home. This obviously made a case for the Zionist cause. Um, in Iran, and many Iranians connected to this message of a Jewish redemption ala Zionism. Another thing that happened uh, among Jews is that just like non-Jewish Iranians, they found political home in the newly formed Communist Party. They supported it and joined it for many reasons. Communist ideology was not one of the main reasons why Jews supported the to the party. The main reason was the to the party being the fiercest opposition to fascist forces in Iran and outside, and their struggle for egalitarian society, 
something that resonated with Iranian Jews that were still lower class, broadly speaking. One interviewee for this research was born in Tehran in the early 1930s and now uh, is residing in Northern America. At the age of 16, he joined the Tudor Party and remained an active member for more than three decades. His political activity landed him in Qasr prison for half a dozen times before he left Iran. He told me, I knew nothing about Marx or Marxism when I joined the Tude. I joined because this was the only place that they didn't call me Juhud, a derogatory term for Jews. I learned Marxism in Qasr prison shortly after I joined the party. So all the intellectual leadership of the Tude party was in prison, so they started classrooms and taught Marxism. On top of that, Jews published communist-leaning newspapers. Um, and some Jews were among the top ranks of the party. So these are a few Jewish, uh, to the affiliated newspapers. Uh, this is Nissan, um, that was uh, affiliated with the two. The, um, they, the, the value of these newspapers go beyond just spreading news. In the times when the official publications of the two, the party were banned, uh, these newspapers became the mouthpiece for the party leadership. So their uh, distribution went far beyond the Jewish community. Uh, this is Bnei Adam, another uh, newspaper. They brought news from the Jewish world, they brought news from uh, remote Jewish uh, communities in Iran, um, and they made a case for supporting the Tude and also all the political uh, arguments that um, were part of the discourse of the time. Uh, this is one of my favorite images because it shows a uh, Jewish classroom in socialist Romania and describing the utopia Jews enjoyed under socialism in Romania. Uh, you may call it fake news today, but back then it was uh, pretty attractive. Um, so um, we have to remember that mainstream Zionism was a socialist movement. The socialist elements of the movement were extremely dominant and extremely socialist. At around the same time of the 1940s, they established the kibbutzim in future Israel, and the kibbutzim were perhaps one of the biggest communist experiments in history. At that point, one could easily feel sympathies for the Zionist project, while at the same time being affiliated with the Iranian Communist Party and fighting alongside the Iranian national movement against the Soviets in the north and the British in the south. Indeed, a multi-hyphenated identity, such as Iranian nationalist, communist, Zionist, was not a rare sight. One of my interviewees came to uh, Israel in the 1950s, and uh, he, was, he talked about his identity, and he said that he's an, an Iranian nationalist, he's a Tudeist, he's a Zionist, and one of the uh, state officials that uh, spoke to him told him, well, you can't be all three, and if you know what's good for you, you choose one, and it's the Zionist. <laughs> um, after the establishment of Israel in 1948, the Zionist movement could no longer be considered a non-state actor. Having discovered the terrible loss of six million Jews in the Holocaust that would have been the human reservoir for Israel, Israel had to find another source to make up for that loss. Again, while it was not their intention in the first place, in 1948, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's prime minister, ordered to find them among the Mizrahi Jews. In the Middle East, from Morocco to Iran, from Yemen to Turkey, there were about 950,000 Jews living. The Israeli goals were to make them immigrate en masse, and war it worked in some of the communities for several reasons, but we see the Yemenite community live in Yemen, Jews in Syria, Lebanon, and Libya left almost completely by 1948, 1949, Iraq by 1951, Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, and Egypt by 1956, but in Iran, where Zionists could operate almost completely openly, and the population was pretty sympathetic to Zionism. The Jews did not consider political Zionism to be their ideal solution. Rather, they were going uh, through rapid process of, modern, of urbanization and becoming an integral part of their homeland society. And global politics helped them, ironically, make these multi-layered and once identities and loyalties. In the early 50s, Habib Levy, the same Habib Levy from the comprehensive history, wrote a report for the Jewish agency in Jerusalem, lamenting the loss of an entire generation 
young generation that preferred leftist Iranian organizations over Zionist ones. To that mix, we can add socialist and Zionist political parties, especially from the spectrum of the Kibbutzi movement that sent em emissaries to Iran, and they found much mutual ground themselves with Iranian socialists and communists. And there were, the, uh, of course, the, the uh, alliance between the Iranian intellectual elite, for example, Jalal Ahmad, that visited Israel in uh, 1963 uh, with his wife, the, the novelist Simin Daneshvar, and they visited uh, Yad Vashem, and they visited the Kibbutzim, and they stayed in Kibbutz Ayel Tashachar in Israel, uh, and uh, he wrote a very important uh, travelogue when he came back. It was recently translated to English. I dearly recommend it. But this is what I found from the Kibbutz guest book uh, in the handwriting of Jalal Ahmad and Simin Daneshvar. Regardless of the hospitality, I saw here people I've never expected to meet, learn people, understanding, open-minded, in a sense, they are implementing Plateau. Honestly speaking, I always identified Israel with the kibbutz, and now I understand why. And Daneshvar, as I see, the kibbutz is the answer to the problems of, the, of all the countries, including our own. Um, as a former kibbutznik, I'll not comment on it, but um, you have to understand that Jalal Ahmad is considered to be one of the prophets of the revolution. He is one of the people that most identified with the new order of the left in Iran. And this is his uh, view of, of Israel uh, in 1963. Um, Israel was also, there were very uh, strong alliances between Israel and Iran in, in many levels. There was one between the governments. A second level was between the opposition movements. And third was between the, uh, the intellectuals, artists um, that went back and forth. There were 18 weekly flights between Tehran and Tel Aviv. Uh, and this is the lineup for uh, uh, the Moulin Rouge Cabaret in, in, uh, in Tehran, 1969. In the second draw, we see artists like Gugush and Vigan, uh, superstars by any scale, but at the top of the headline, the international singer Tova uh, Porat, an Israeli singer. Um, I did not know of her until I came across this poster. Uh, but in Iran, she was a big star. And this was, uh, again, one of the most prominent nightclubs in Iran. So in those times, we see Zionist and Israeli involvement in Jewish life in Iran. Zionist clubs and youth movements were active. However, Iranian youth did not engage Zionism as Israeli officials had hoped. Indeed, Zionism had become more complex than in 1917. The 25,000 Iranian Jews that had immigrated to Israel between 1948 and 1951 were the poorest and the neediest uh, of the Iranian Jewish communities. But there were myriad of stories at the time of Jews who had immigrated and returned or immigrated and wanted to return. And the important thing was that Iranian Jews overall had a sober idea of what was waiting for them on the other side of the Zionist story, unlike many other Middle Eastern Jews. A telling example is given in Stanley Abramowitz's uh, report in 1951. Stanley Abramowitz was one of the directors of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee in Iran, where he describes one instance of Jews from Nehevand. I quote, the letters that come from Israel dampen all spirits. The Iranian Jew is not the Halutzik, pioneer type. The ordeals of present day life in Israel have left him discouraged, longing to return to his dark, damp ghetto room, for he has been used to that room and even liked it. Food is available in Iran, and though he earned little, he lived in an environment which was not strange to him. The language, the people, the life was familiar, Israel is not. As a Persian, he is looked down upon, the letters that come back from Iran, to Iran complain about the shortage of food. Nehvand received a letter and a Torah scroll from their brethren in Israel. The Nehvand Jews in Israel signed their names on this piece of scroll. In the accompanying letter, they wrote that they took an oath by the Torah from which they sent a piece, that their brethren in Nehvand will not come to Israel now anyway, not until they inform them that the time is more suitable. And Nehvand is a godforsaken place in the mountains of Loristan, 
cut off from the outside world. Yet the Lenschleit in Israel advised them, adjured them to remain in Evand. Another family was advised not to leave for Israel until their son Joseph is married. Joseph is one year old. <laughs> Another interesting and nuanced uh, idea uh, comes from Elias Hakyan. Elias Hakyan was a teacher and principal of Alliance schools in Iran for over 25 years. He wrote in his memoir, Iran has been my homeland, Vatan, and Jerusalem has been the source of my belief in God and Mark Eble. This quotation suggests yet again that many Iranian Jews had different interpretations of Zionism than the one the Jewish agency in Israel advanced. As Hakyan was a role model for many Iranians, and it is clear that his national identity of Iranian did not interfere with his religious identity as a Jew. He proudly projected his combined identity throughout his career, which may have inspired and encouraged his, uh, his students. Um, again, this is something that we see a lot towards the late 70s, uh, this uh, combined identity of Jewish and Iranian, Iranian and Jewish rather, um, so we know that there was, Jews were part of the revolutionary movement. There was actually elections in Iran in nine, March 1978, so full nine months before the Shah left Iran. And a revolutionary organization won the Jewish community's elections in 1978. So the, in a way, the Jewish community was revolutionized before the rest of the country. Uh, it, was, uh, it was led by two uh, leaders who became, who were former two-day leaders. They served time in the Shah's prison, um, Harun Yeshaya and uh, Aziz Daneshrad. Um, they published a revolutionary newspaper. Um, they organized uh, events and speaking engagements for uh, the leaders of the revolutionary movement in synagogues. Um, this is, for example, um, one of the biggest demonstrations in September 1978, uh, and there were 12,000 Jews uh, in, the in, the, in this demonstration. Um, another story that uh, I like to tell, do we have time? How much time do we have? All right, so I'll take like a few more minutes. Um, in April 1979, uh, People still didn't know which direction the revolution is going to take. And it was actually, uh, in a way, it was a pretty euphoric time in Iran. And in April 1979, uh, the Iranian state television hosted a show on Passover. It was Passover. They wanted to show how the values of Passover connect to the values of the revolution. and let the Jews feel more welcomed within the ranks of the revolutionary movement. Uh, and they hosted uh, Aziz Daneshrad, who was one of the leaders of the community, and he was a member of the Constitution uh, Drafting Committee at the time, and uh, one of the Tehran rabbis. And uh, they talked about how the story of Passover is going from slavery to freedom, just like the Iranian revolution, and they talked about how um, the, uh, the ideas of liberty, of freedom. They also talked about Khomeini and Moses as, as, as equals. Uh, but towards the end of the show, the host asked, uh, he basically he dropped a bomb. And he asked, is it true that all the Jews are Zionists? Now, to say in Iran, on state TV, in 1979, that all the Jews are Zionists is nothing less than um, than, than a bomb. And the two guests were taken aback, and the first to respond was the rabbi. And he asked the host, what is Zionism? What is Zion? Do you know? Zion is the biblical name of Jerusalem. I love Jerusalem. I pray to Jerusalem. If it makes me a Zionist, then yes, I'm a Zionist, and all the Jews are Zionists. You're a Muslim, right? You pray to Mecca. You like Mecca. Are you Saudi? Now, to say to an Iranian, 
that his loyalties lie with Saudi over Iran. If there's one country that Iranians <laughs> liked less, even back then. So that was, that was a, a, a moment that showed how Jews conceptualize Zionism. And there's another story of the Sapir Hospital in Tehran during the revolution that I won't get into it. Um, but basically, uh, it was one of the places to which they uh, took wounded protesters from the revolution, from the demonstrations, and uh, the Savak could not uh, get to the hospital to uh, pick up the, the protesters. Um, I cover it in my book. But um, now, with the delicate situation between Israel and Iran since 1979, the Jews of Iran were even more courageous to remain true to their own interpretation of Judaism and Zionism. Even after the revolution, Iranian Jews emigrated to the US and much fewer to Israel. About 25 to 30 percent of the community chose to stay in Iran. They still recognize the right of Israel to exist and are interested in the going-ons in Israel. They visit Israel, and many of them have relatives there. Even when speaking in public, in the press, or the parliament, they say that the most deplorable thing about Israel is not its existence, but its refusal to become part of the Middle East, to make peace, to make peace with its Arab neighbors and other issues concerning the ethnic tensions in Israel. I would like to end uh, with a short excerpt from one of my favorite memoirs of Jewish-Iranian experience in 1970s by Roya Hakakian, Journey from the Land of No, where she tells about a Passover Seder night in her family house in Tehran, 1977. I quote, Naturally, it caused an uproar at the Seder when father asked Uncle Ardi to read the Halachma. Everyone burst into laughter, even before he began. He obeyed and read, but not without a touch of subversion, a bit of mischief. This is the bread of affliction, some affliction, that our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. This year we are slaves. May this slavery never end. This year here, next year at home in Israel. Pardon me for not packing. The family dreamed of the land of milk and honey, but wanted to wake up in Tehran. After reciting the Halachma, Uncle Adi asked, So, Hakakian, are your bags packed, or is the flight to Jerusalem postponed for another year? Father smiled and waved him away, assuming his question had been meant in jest. But Uncle Adi, without the slightest hint at humor, pressed on, Really, Hakakian, why say it? Why not leave it as a love thy neighbor like thyself and call off the rest? Thank you very much. Israeli companies, engineers, 
um, consultancies, etc. Did they also bring with them this kind of ideological baggage as we saw in the 30s and 40s of kind of <coughs> Zionist propaganda, or was it really separate? Yeah, all right. So the question of identity is, uh, is so important, so crucial, and I'm not sure that we can come to a perfect answer that puts to rest all the, uh, all the different parts of, all the different ingredients of this question. Um, I think that at the end, at the bottom line, the, uh, the way that Iranian Jews identified themselves in the 70s, until the 70s, in Iran, and, uh, and this was the ultimate success of the Pahlavi project. The Pahlavi project allowed them to think of themselves as part, as equal part of the Iranian society, and not to resort to the religious ethnic identities that uh, were part of the old Iranian societies. Um, in a way, despite what I'm saying about the, uh, the Iranian revolution and Jews being part of the revolutionary movement, when Iranian Jews came to this country, they experienced the immigration and the story of Iran in different ways than, uh, than um, it made them rethink about their history in Iran. So they came up, and it's very shallow the way that I'm presenting it now, but they had to come up with a different community story, a story that explains how the revolution stole their country. And now, in the, and they came to, Iraq, to the U.S. in 79 as the uh, hostage crisis was on every screen in every home. And to identify oneself with Iran was not a smart thing if you wanted to integrate in the new society. And the only thing that the average American knew about Iran is that right now there are hostages in the American consulate there. Uh, so the, we see the, the emergence of the new Persian identity that pretty much controls the American Jewish communities in the, in the US. And we see how uh, they, again, as, as I showed in the beginning, they, they write in their story in Iran that fits the vocabulary and the world of, of images that was provided by the American Jewish community that existed here before and has no roots in, in the Middle East. Uh, and, but we see that they are extremely attached to the Iranian heritage. This is the only community of immigrants that we can see third generation still speaking Persian. Um, I mean, this is not something that you can see almost in any other community of immigrants. Uh, in the Sunday school in Los Angeles, they teach in Persian. Um, the synagogue, the, in the synagogue in Los Angeles, the signs are in Persian. It's, it's, a, living it's, not, it's a living memory. They still try to, uh, uh, to not abandon, and, and it goes to, only to other personal stories that are truly heartbreaking. Few of my interviewees, had lived in this country 20 and 30 years before they applied for American citizenship. They didn't want the American citizenship because it meant that they are here to stay. And they lived here for 20 and 30 years hoping to go back to Iran. Not while the Islamic Republic is still the, the ruling power, the ruling uh, paradigm, but you know, with the return of Pahlavi or whatever other um, reality. So I hope that I... Uh, yeah. uh, would they still give this answer today? The answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense of, I'll start with the no. No, because most of the community left. Uh, most of the community left, uh, mostly to the US after the 1979 revolution. But yes, in the sense that there are still a big community there, co big compared to other Middle Eastern communities. I mean, this is the biggest community, Jewish community in the Middle East outside Israel. And they are not, we mustn't think about them as behind uh, Iron Curtain. They are not locked in Iran. It's not not without my daughter scenario. It's, they can go, they leave, they visit Israel, they go back. It's interesting to talk to them and see how they, I mean, I interviewed many of them in Israel. And it's interesting to see how they view our life in Israel from their perspective. Um, and these people, 
would not replace Iran for any other thing, not the US and not Israel. They visit Israel, actually by US law, they can come here and get permanent residency immediately. But they don't do it because Iran is, they cannot imagine themselves in any other place. Uh, government relations. So the companies that came to, uh, the Israeli companies that came to Iran in the 1960s and 70s uh, were very different from the experience of the 30s through late 50s. Until the late 50s, Israel believed that eventually the Iranian Jews would immigrate to Israel. Um, they believed that uh, that They'll come to their senses and move back. But what happened was that there was a reverse migration. Uh, many Iranian Jews got good jobs in uh, the government companies that worked in Iran and went back to Iran as representative of Israeli companies. And it actually helped them climb the social ladder in Iran. Uh, another thing was that the community was profoundly transformed over a short period of time. Uh, in 1941, and I'll be very brief, in 1941, the JDC, the Jewish Distribution Committee, conducted a survey in Iran and found that out, out of the 100,000 100, Iranian Jews, 10% uh, were among the, um, intele the, the country's economic elites, 10% were middle class, and 80% were impoverished, rural, poor Jews. In 1977, the same organization conducted another survey, and they found that, again, the number of Jews was about 100,000, 100,000. 10% were still the economic elite. 80% were middle class and upper middle class. In the, 19, in the early 1960s, Israel decided, and we have the documentation, they decided to stop treating Iranian Jews as uh, as they treated Jews from uh, what they call uh, the poor countries and Jews at risk. And, they, start, and they, they moved them to the same category as the US, England, Australia, and South Africa, which is affluent, safe communities. So um, the, the kind of relations were uh, actually benefited both the, the, the both countries and also uh, the Iranian Jewish community, um, it created a different branch of the Iranian Jewish community, which was the Israeli community in Iran. And it's another story, but. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you just mentioned a, a breakdown from the 1970s about how the Iranian Jewish community was faring economically and socially. How would you describe the Iranian Jewish community today uh, if, you're, if those statistics exist? Um, today, the Iranian, uh, let me say, Iranian Jews are not well off or worse off than any other Iranians. They are, they, they are discriminated against by law in many parts, but it's Iran. Uh, the law is very, um, problematic to begin with. Um, they are part of the middle class today, most br overwhelmingly. They are middle class, again, which is a category that is problematic in and of itself today. But they are not, uh, especially under Rouhani, uh, they enjoyed many uh, achievements, political achievements. For example, uh, a few years ago, the Majlis uh, made it into law that Jewish students in public schools don't have to come on Saturday, which is something that the Jewish community was trying to get uh, for decades. Um, in December 2014, the government uh, unveiled the monument commemorating the Jewish fallen soldiers in the Iran-Iraq war, which is a major achievement for the Jews to be part of this important story of Iran in the post-revolution. So it's complicated. <laughs> uh, question there and then question and then for the, the 
You know, the connection of the Jewish Iranian goes way, way back. At least we know two and a on the Jews. So, especially in one town which is called Hamedan, there there is the tomb of Esther and, his, and her uncle Mordecai. And you have to see how vibrant this community is. That's their home. I mean, nobody can say anything to that community. And I had the fortune to be more associated with the Jewish in Iran because we were Christians and the minority, uh, there were some foreign schools which the minorities were attracted to. And actually so who could guess who her Jewish and Iranians and their good but anyway, I think that's one of the reasons because they are deeply rooted. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I'm just wondering if you could tell us to what do you attribute the lack of literature in schools about the Middle East? Uh, she, uh, the question was uh, to what I attribute the lack of literature on Iranian Jews. And um, I think the, the lack of literature on the Middle East. On the Middle East? All right, so it's even easier to answer. <laughs> um, I, it, just because the, the Middle East was not seen as part of the national identity of Israel. And the, I, I mean, Israelis, this is something, again, I, I'm, I'm happy to come back for a, diff a different talk. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Israelis consider themselves European, and uh, they play in the uh, uh, Champions League in Europe. They go to the Eurovision Song Contest, uh, and they are a villa in the jungle. Uh, therefore, there's no need of studying the history of the Middle East. Um, and again, there is a long, painful history of how Jews from Middle Eastern background were treated by the Israeli state in the first years. And it's been corrected over the past decade or so. It's been slowly corrected. But, you know, uh, just a few months ago, there was an exhibit in the Israeli Museum in Tel Aviv. Um, and the, the title of the exhibit was uh, living with no return. Uh, and the title of the show was Living with No Return, uh, The End of Judaism in the Middle East. And it provided, it was very beautiful aesthetically, but it provided the most simplistic explanation. It's, I, I don't know who can even find it sufficient, but it was just several anecdotes to explain the end of Judaism in the Middle East. Now, we can argue whether Jewish history really ended in the Middle East. There is a big community in Iran. By the way, in, the, uh, in this exhibit, 1979 was the end of Jewish existence in Iran. They didn't care to mention that there is still a community of 20,000 something uh, in Iran. There is a community of some 5,000 in Morocco, 3,000 in, uh, in Tunisia. There is a, a Jewish minister in the Tunisian government. All these things don't, there is a national project in Egypt today of renovating 12 synagogues. There, there are three Jews living in Cairo. But what does it mean that they are renovating 12 synagogues now? So, I mean, they just, I mean, it's not part of the national story, therefore, uh, th there's no need to produce knowledge on it. Very, 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 very quick. I try to be, and I try to connect all the things that are going on in my head. And there is an amazing proliferation of the foundation of the synagogues in places like Tehran. Yeah. And you kept, uh, you actually right now mentioned the change from the 80% of the lower middle class uh, disadvantage to the 80% middle class. Some of this which I always found very interesting is the sort of an exiting of Jews from rural areas and moving to the urban areas during the Fatimid period, which sort of both introduces them to this uh, socialist background and also helps them very much identify with this new nationalist 
national project. How much of this do you see in, kind of in effective in both creating the sense of belonging and also in reality creating the Jewish community of Iran as a distinctive thing that might even be suspected of connecting or having sympathies for Zionism in Israel? Oof. <laughs> 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I mean, yes. <laughs> to, see, to see how the internal migration patterns influence the understanding of Zionism and Jewish identity and Iranian nationalism is, is fascinating. And I try to do it, uh, hopefully, in, uh, in a good way in my book. But you see people that came from the rural, so this was a, a period of urbanization, people moving from the villages to the cities, and many Jews from poor villages and remote villages moved to Tehran uh, because this was the, there was a, a, a Jewish agency camp of preparation for immigration to Israel. And they were waiting for three and four years, and by that time they already settled in Tehran and they changed their plans. They didn't want to move to Israel anymore. So they, they had to uh, reinvent themselves as Iranian, as Tehruni, as whatever uh, identity they could come up with. Thank you. Thank you.